I'm going to introduce you to Jillian and Dan. They are from a company called Threat Quotient, and they're going to be talking about their uh, building of a security program. Take it away, guys. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Welcome to Back to Basics, our journey of building a security uh, program at a small startup. Uh, I am Dan Erksleben. This is Julian DeFranzo. Um, yeah, so my name is Julian. Uh, I'm a solutions architect at ThreatQuotient. So my day to day is you know, dealing with integrations and you know, building uh, any kind of custom integration that we can do for our product and also any forward thinking research. Uh, I have some background in you know, building uh, security programs and some smaller startups and smaller companies, uh, but I've also worked in a, a major uh, SOC provider as well as an analyst. Uh, I am currently a DevOps engineer, but I am sort of a jack of all trades IT guy. I do all of our, uh, from help desk to systems engineer to uh, AWS management to cloud management, uh, automation, uh, configuration management. Uh, everything. Um, I this is my second startup. I I came from Sourcefire as well as Julian, um, and I've been with ThreatQ for about a year now. Yeah. So a keynote. Uh, you know, our titles. You know, usually are important, but for this presentation, uh, and we'll get to it in a second. It's kind of an interesting, an interesting fact. So so why are we here? So. Um, you know, we were asked by some, our security exec or executives, uh, um, and you know, a lot of them were paranoid, and rightfully so, uh, to build a security program. Uh, and, and the challenge and the kicker is without any resources. We, we don't barely have any budget. Um, you know, we don't even have a dedicated resource or resources to, to build this program. Um, and, and that's what I mean by the previous slide is, you know, Dan and I have day jobs, and we were asked to build, you know, a security program, a security team. Uh, in our free time, basically. So, so the point of this talk is, you know, to go over some of those challenges. You know, what we're focusing on, uh, and, and you know, kind of what we're you know trying to achieve. You know, with what we have. Um, and, and in general, you know, security is easy. I mean, I mean, it's a lot of it's common sense. But building a security program from scratch is hard. You know, you try to fight the urge to do all the things and all the cool stuff that you may have done in a previous life, or you know, the latest thing you're seeing on Twitter. Uh, and that's all great, but you know, if you don't have the foundation uh, of anything, it, it's kind of hard, hard to know where to prioritize or where to start. And where do you start? Uh, really, the nuts and bolts of our presentation are: where do you start when you have limited resources, limited time, and no funds? Where do you start when you have an existing culture that you don't want to blow up, but want? to do the right thing and keep everyone secure and, and maintain your, your good reputation. Uh, what do you, where do you start when there's no silver bullet to security management? Um, uh, automation and orchestration type deals are, are great when you're a, a mature company and, and you have a, a, a team of dedicated security professionals, but we're a bunch of like worker bees who are, are just trying to uh, uh, do the right thing and, and keep us uh, moving in the right direction. Um, the, uh, lucky enough that we work for a security company and we are all, uh, a, the majority of our development team and executives are all, ex uh, are all security professionals, so we have vast resources to utilize uh, in order to, to, to move forward and to uh, put these things in place. They, there's an understanding there, but we also don't want to wreck anybody's day to day with strict security guidelines. Um, and also, we were handed a handful of guys to use as resources and they all have conflicting uh, things that they've done in the past and everyone, of course, is right. So how do, you, how do we, as lower end guys, uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. Julian's internet famous, so yeah. um, how do I, as a nobody, make it all work the right way? There is no, there is no right way. 
Yeah, and, and to the point about the silver bullet, like even if it did exist, and if if it does, and it's free, can you guys let us know? Um, even if even if there was one, we can't afford it. Like we have a negative negative budget, so you know this is challenging and trying to figure out you know where do you start. So you know we we put things into into three categories. Like where do we want to start in our initial plan? And to start, we wanted to establish a security centric environment. You know, in a, a culture that's security first, and you know, in a maturing company that's not going to harsh anyone's buzz. We didn't want to impact you know this this you know, startup life, you know, hashtag startup life uh, mentality. Uh, and we want, but we also wanted to, you know, start having people think about security. Uh, the next thing is, you know, inventory all the things. We wanted to get an idea of, you know, what's out there, who's using what, where is data stored, um, and just get an idea of, you know, where, where are our holes, where, where are we, you know, where are our gaps, you know, what are we missing, uh, just to get an understanding of what's out there. Um, and lastly is writing policies. So. You know, everybody loves policies, both writing and reading. Um, so, you know, it's great when you have to tie that with, you know, a startup culture. So it, it's a challenge to say, you know, I want to define these secure practices and policies um, without being overbearing, without, you know, saying, hey, I'm going to ban all this and you can't do anything uh, except for using uh, PowerPoint. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, kind of where we bucketized all these things. So, so for culture, we, you know, we're a security company. We we like to hire people that are you know passionate about security. So we have a lot of people that are, have an interest, whether it be technical or from you know you know I'm interested in the in, in the market stuff like that. Anyone uh, is or everyone is interested, uh, and we want to take advantage of that. Um, you know, establish a culture that's you know security first, uh, and, and by doing that, you know people you know people care, uh, and, and we broke it down into two things. We wanted to be visible as a team and we wanted to effectively communicate to everyone. Uh, you know, we're pre you know, predominantly a remote company. Um, I think about what, 80% of our workforce is, is remote. Um, but we wanted to establish this quote unquote open door policy. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure that people are, you know, know who we are as a team, you know, what we're trying to achieve and, you know, you know, put, you know, you know, faces to names and, and, and whatnot, um, you know, so that we're not seen as that, you know, working security team that's, you know, in the shadows and you don't really know who they are other than they tell me what I can and can't do. Um, and, you know, a big chunk of that is, you know, open Slack channels, right? So we, you know, like every startup or really any company nowadays, it lives in, lives in Slack. So we have these channels, you know, that are open to, you know, discuss news topics or even go in, in depth. We have separate channels that are more technically uh, involved about uh, certain breaches or, you know, I found this tool and I use this and, you know, and why it's cool and stuff like that. And we kind of do, we're starting to do some, you know, brown bags and, and stuff like that to, to further that point. Um, you know, and, and, you know, by doing that, people feel welcome to talk about security. We also have uh, an open, you know, security uh, channel to, you know, for people to ask questions, you know, you know, what's the best way to, to, you know, what's the best password manager? Or stuff like that. Simple questions that you know, you know, Dan and I or, or anyone can really ask. And it's not really just us answering questions. It's you know, everyone in the company is free to you know, answer, you know, give any advice and stuff like that. Because that's that's what we're trying. That's what we're all about. And, and the second thing is effective communication. We we want to establish this cadence of communication with our employees so that they're used to hearing from us. So we're not we're not just again telling them what they can and can't do. We wanted to you know bug the crap out of them in a good way to say, hey, we're here. You should keep thinking about security, uh, and, and this is why. So the best example we have is you know, every week we have an email uh, communication to, the, to our whole company. Um, it usually talks about like news and events and you know, any kind of social media campaigns we're doing as a company. Um, so we carved out a little section to talk about security. Uh, and in most weeks, it's about news, you know, what happened in the last week. Uh, any kind of analysis around this kind of stuff, but we also talk about you know, dress, like blog articles and you know giving you know writing out uh, stories about you know what's you know what password manager like up here like this is the types of things that you should be thinking about. Use a password manager, and here's why, and you know you know give it kind of anecdotal information about that, um, and you know this is letting us set the groundwork for once we start writing policies uh, and, you know, enacting these standards to, 
uh, before we do that, we're kind of backing up our reasoning, right? So you know, before we say, hey, you need to enable two-factor auth authentication on everything, it's, hey, you should start doing this in your personal life. You should start doing these things. And you know, we're backing it up. And we're not just saying, uh, hey, you need to do this. It's, hey, you need to do this, and here's why. And have this open dialogue about these things. So you know, we've had people you know, respond and say, hey, I use this password manager, or hey, I'm doing this. Uh, and it kind of opens that dialogue, dialogue there. And you know, we're trying to do this you know, without being this overly stuffy, stereotypical security team. So we're, you know, we're lighthearted uh, for the most part, even though Dan's rough exterior. Um, and we, we, as you'll see later on, and you know, in previous slides, you know, we have memes, because that's important, uh, but only when appropriate. So, so inventorying all the things. Uh, we adopted a, a, a crawl, walk, yog type uh, mentality uh, when we first started meeting and, uh, and approaching security as a whole. Uh, spreadsheets. Everyone loves spreadsheets as much as policies. Uh, but we need to know, we need to create a security baseline. So we started with documenting literally everything. Uh, we're a young company, but uh, no one knows where anything is. So uh, we started with uh, creating a central location. We use Google Docs to, to maintain everything and, and collaborate as a team. Uh, we started off documenting all of our known hardware, all of our, our laptops, everything that's piecing together old uh, audits and uh, receipts. And we, we figured out how many Windows laptops uh, to Mac laptops to network devices and what printers are out there. And we've standardized our networking equipment, but what's plugged into those ASAs that we're managing. Um, and that allows us to, to attack what the most uh, vulnerable of those are uh, when we get around to our actionable items. Um, documenting all of our software. We use a lot a, of, of cloud tech. Um, uh, how, who, who's managing those softwares? Who's managing those licenses if they have a license? Who knows when they're going to expire? It's, it's really embarrassing when your, your, your SSL cert for your website goes expiring, isn't it? So we need to know what the point of contact for literally everything in our, our company is. And we, we're a young startup, and we've been flying by night. So how do we reel in all of that spreadsheet hell? Um, then we get to do some of the fun stuff by moving on to, to network scans. Uh, you can start off with Nessus and NMAP scans just to validate what you're, you're putting on paper. But uh, uh, you just, we used a lot of demo softwares and uh, uh, free licensing and some open source stuff to get a better idea of what, uh, what our infrastructure is really made of. We, we work out of uh, Colo for most of our development. Um, so we want to make sure that we know exactly what is behind that firewall uh, moving forward. We don't, know, we don't manage it. We don't have hands on the grounds. We have to know in case anybody plugs anything and that shouldn't get plugged in. Um, same with vulnerability management. We're using freewares and demos to sort of get an idea of what our, our baseline vulnerabilities are of our current infrastructure. It's my favorite slide. Who is your daddy and what does he do? Uh, it's uh, data. We move on to, we move from hardware to data. Um, and who are your most vulnerable people? Your front office and your HR people. People who are primarily Windows users, um, who in a startup, you, you don't have policies in effect yet, so data could be literally anywhere. They could be sitting on unencrypted laptops, uh, sitting in shares with no, uh, with shared usernames and passwords and no two-factor authentication. So it, it was an exhaustive process of interviews, sitting down with your CFO and your HR reps and getting an idea of all of the software they use and where their data is. And it, it, it went into our inside out mentality where we started on the inside and found out where all the, the real vulnerabilities are, which are, as we found out, mostly people, mostly users from other presentations today. Um, so we were able to strike on some of the low hanging fruit like encrypting hard drives and uh, managing user accounts in these cloud softwares that we 
don't know, we had no access to. Um, and making two-factor two authentication like a thing for everyone. Next slide. So actually, before we go to the next slide, um, and the goal for this wasn't to call people out for you know, being dumb or wrong or not doing secure things. It's we just want to understand what people are doing, right? So we, we can't protect what we don't know. And just by understanding how people are using certain tools, where they're storing things, uh, we, get, we just get a better sense of you know, the workflow of everything. And then we can say, OK, well, you know, I know you're using these tools and you're doing these practices. And we don't want to disrupt you because we're all about trying to get customers and everything right now just because we're so early stage. Um, but let's inject some, some security into those practices without disrupting your life, right? So, uh, you're, you're thinking just enable two-factor authentication, like Dan said, you know, encrypting your laptop if you're going to store stuff locally. All the simple wins that we can do, we, we went out and we tried to knock out. And for interviewing, we did not do that. We did not beat them up, <laughs> obviously. Um, so policies, I know I, I talked about earlier, and we, we, love, we all love writing policies. Uh, we all love reading them. Um, so uh, even you know outside of a startup, no one likes to do that. So when you factor in uh, a startup culture, it's you know it's a challenge that we need and that we need to you know need to respect our culture. We don't want to. Um, no one wants to read these strict, dense policies that tell them what they can and can't do. Uh, and, and we need to tailor our you know everything that we write to our audience. And we also at the same time have to remember how mature we are as both a security program and as a company. So that comes into play when we need to pick out what we need to start standardizing or what, what policies we need to start with. Um, and you know, that's kind of where we, you know, we sat down and we're like, well, you know, we're just building these things. Uh, what, are these, what, are the, what are the three things that we want to do? And you know, with that, it's first thing was workstation standards. Um, we identified that we have you know, you know, 60 or so Macs and you know, and number of Windows machines. So we went, scoured the web for best practices uh, and standards, and you know, stuff like full disk encryption, you know, strong complex passwords, firewall, screen timeout, stuff like that, uh, to to you know, memorialize in the standard. And you know, the the goal was to for there to be no surprises for our users. No one should be reading this and say, oh. I don't want to do that. That's dumb. It's it should be nothing. Should be terribly inconvenient. It's oh yeah, this is obvious. I already do this when I first got my laptop anyway. Uh, so that's kind of how we approach those workstation standards. Um, the next is acceptable use policy. Uh, you know, a lot of time when people see you know the term acceptable use, they start to hyperventilate uh, because now you're telling me that I have to use my laptop in a certain way at a certain time and stuff like that. Um, but it's it's incredibly uh, important to start laying out and putting some you know some walls and rules around how our users can start using their machines, um, you know just just to you know cover our ass really or just to understand you know making sure that we are identifying some of the the you know uh, attack surfaces in our environment. So we want to make sure that people aren't you know downloading and installing software that's not necessarily needed for their day to day job and. It's, it's all going to be common sense and you know startup friendly language. You know it's going to be you know not this super long document with tons of bullet points. We're going to have uh, you know a nice one pager to cover everything that you can easily un understand. It. And, and it's again we're not banning everything. We're loosening the reins a little bit. We want to empower our users to to make good decisions, but at the same time we need to have s some some documentation around that. And then lastly, something that's near and dear to my heart, which is vulnerability management. Um, you know, we wanted to identify you know, what that even means for us. right? So you know, what are the tools we can use? How can we use them? Uh, and my, in my first month that I started at ThreatQuotient, uh, MariaDB came out with a, a number of vulnerabilities um, that you know, scared the crap out of some executives. Um, and so they came to us, and they were like, what do we do? We're, they're all panicking. like. Uh, chickens with their head cut off. Um, so I'm like, well, this can't happen again. So this is a prime example of we started with our product side first, right? So identified that you know there's some gaps in how we can handle uh, the future MariaDB vulnerabilities because they bring us a lot of sadness. Um, so we wanted to identify you know who's involved in this remediation process, right? So you know who who does the work for the patching? How do we how can we 
place it and what sprint it's going to happen and what release it's going to happen and how do we you know communicate that effectively to our scrum ma manager and, and you know everyone involved in the process uh, and, you know how do we communicate to our customers that this is you know this happened this is when it's coming out with a release uh, so it just it's a high level process uh, that we came up with but it, it saves us uh, you know a lot because we've had a number of times whether it be you know vulnerability drop and we find out uh, on our own research or customers come to say hey I've, I've identified these vulnerabilities we can say oh we know this we already know that and we have this in an upcoming release or it's oh that's something we need to identify and we work that through our process that we've defined um, and again because we're a security company this like this is something we need to nail so that we're seen as you know a mature we know what we're doing um, you know, when the next step after that is, you know, vulnerability management of our internal infrastructure. Uh, you know, it's, this is kind of easy right now just because we can use the previous process and also it's basically just me and Dan. So I can just do our scan and say, hey, Dan, fix this and he'll patch it in five minutes. Um, but by de defining this process uh, now, we can uh, start evolving it once we start, if we were to double or triple in size over the next few years. Uh, and where we're going to need a more mature process uh, by having it now and you know just identifying any kind of problems early on it's going to make make our lives a lot easier uh, in the long run so now we have policies we have procedures uh, we have lots of documentation how do we start enforcing these things when you're a remote company like we said earlier we're 80 percent uh, mostly 80 percent remote and and a lot of companies are, are, are taking on the, the remote environment. So we've come up with uh, standardized security training. We've come up with slides, and we're making it mandatory for new employees as well as existing employees. And some certain employees are getting extra security training. Uh, we publish all of our documentation to a uh, public wiki, and we direct people and like our Rhino reader uh, blurbs to, to documents in our, in our wiki. Uh, and uh, we agreed on a, a, a standard of tools and apps for everyone to really use, like a, a standard browser, like malware uh, detection. Uh, we'd like everyone to be Mac OS, but there are some people that refuse to use it. Um, but I digress. So with that, you know, what comes next? What do, what, do, what do we do after we've done these things? And it's, you know, it's time to do real security work. You know, assuming we can find some free time and you know some free resources and you know interested people, um, let's start enforcing the policies and standards that we just sent out to everyone. Um, you know, start actually doing like wh what are the other like cool security teams doing? You know, Netflixes and Amazon and, and Rapid Seven. Um, you know, what are they doing? And start like mimicking that uh, and try to figure out w what to do. So you know. We've said that two-factor authentication is important. Uh, let's start doing that on more than just Gmail. Let's enact it on all of our systems, uh, any kind of cloud-based things that help me offer it. Just enable it and use it and, and, and enforce that. Um, you know, let's start essentially logging all of our stuff because we're we got a lot, a lot of sprawl going on. So we just want to be able to identify what, what you know if there's any attackers that are already there. Um, Let's automate some vulnerability scans and you know automatically you know remediate those things because we're such you know a small environment for the most part. This should be easy. It's you know I do a scan with a tool. Here are the results. Let's just automatically patch our boxes. We don't have much of an impact right now. So if we figure out that process now, it'll make it a lot easier. Uh, buzzwords, uh, they're out there. Uh, CIS top controls is something we've adopted as a standard. We've made it through three of the top five um, want to keep moving forward with that. Uh, uh, automating the mundane stuff. Uh, we want to automate, from a DevOps perspective, we want to automate as much as humanly possible. But uh, we also want to inject security into that procedures. Like, for instance, we have a, a, a full-on QA Jenkins uh, chain that gets kicked off with every PR. But with every pull request, there's a uh, the code gets dumped to a one of the slave nodes and gets scanned by uh, a malware scanner so that we know that everything that is getting eventually dumped onto our uh, repos and our servers are, are malware free to our knowledge. Um, and also a new, not hot new thing is this concept of chat ops. 
Um, and you know, being that we live in Slack, it's a great opportunity to let's just have bots to do all our work for us because it's not like we have the time to do it anyway. Um, so you know, notify us. You know, if we once we have the central logging, notify us of all the weird shit. Um, you know, if people, if we can, you know, automate you know responses to simple questions in our in our security channel, say, hey, you know, I was you know kind of read those and you know give you know helpful responses, uh, and that's a kind of a quick win, just because we just we can't always be watching other channels. Um, you know, and also, you know, make sure that people aren't just pasting passwords and API keys and stuff like that all throughout our channels. A lot of our development uh, and our and engineering side is based on using third-party APIs. So there's plenty of API keys being shared around. So it's something that we can tighten up uh, for sure. Um, so that's kind of a, this whole new nebulous thing of chat ops. And, and lastly, um, let's like, use our own product. Now our product, for those who don't know, is a threat intelligence platform. Um, I'm not going to get into too much details because also not over a lot of time, but like it's designed for more mature uh, security organizations that have the threat intel team or a threat hunting team uh, or really anyone that's that's focusing on that. Um, so we're not ready for that, but we can you know start tailoring it towards our needs. Um, you know how do we use uh, how can we use our product to, to further enhance you know further uh, you know, feature enhancements, or you know, this is how you know I've noticed this wonky behavior. You know, it's kind of this full circle of we're using it for our own defense, but we're also enhancing uh, our own product. So it kind of you know helps a lot of people by doing that. So that's something that uh, we need to figure out, just because you know we don't have much use yet for a threat intel platform. But you know, our platform is so flexible enough that there's plenty of things that we can do with it uh, to, to help us out. And that's it. That's what we got. Thank that's you. That's all for we coming. got. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any questions? Yes. Um, so the question is, you know, we're kind of generic on what tools we use. Uh, we did that um, on purpose, uh, just being, it's just a lot easier to be agnostic. Um, but, you know, we're, I want to answer your question, but we don't want to be get too specific on what tools, just because we have those relationships. But We haven't paid or adopted anything. We're making, yeah, do, so with, we're do, making do with a, a baseline information from, from demos sure. and, and, and sort of deciding on what gives us what we need for the best cost? Yeah, so we're st we're actually like we're doing these things, but we're also trying to figure out what what is what is the best tool in the first place. Yeah. So you know, we value yeah, that. I mean, we also we could tell you. I mean, there well, there's a ton of them out there, and we've demoed a lot of them. It's it's going to be it's going to be specific for your environment really, and what your budget is. Yeah. Um, if you're more interested, I can tell you one-on-one, -on -one, I can't, can't broadcast it. Any other questions? Any